Welcome to Millennium Bible Institute's introductory study on the versions of the Bible. Now, it's important. This I know this is a, a big debate among people, and you may have already heard some things about this. If you haven't, then great. You're going to be kind of a blank slate, and I'll get to fill some things in for you. If you have heard about this already, then you may already be polarized one way or the other. What I need to do is explain to you what we're doing at Millennium Bible Institute and why we do it. It's worth knowing about because this is an important, important decision that you will make regarding what Bible you're going to use as a study Bible, what Bible you're going to uh, base your understanding of the Scriptures on. So I want to talk about that. And again, it's just a, a single session, so we have a lot of ground to cover. Just as you have a lot of choices to make and which translation, I will tell you now, all translations are not created equal. There are some big differences there, and I need you to understand what those differences are. But it's not going to be as complicated as you think. We're actually going to talk about this by beginning with two important doctrines. The first one is the doctrine of inspiration. Now, I'm not going to go into a lengthy detail about that, because actually we could spend four or five hours easy on the doctrine of inspiration. We don't have time to do that. But I do want to talk about inspiration in conjunction with another important doctrine, preservation. Now, those two kind of go hand in hand, and one thing that I want you to understand, about, and those are important doctrines. I don't mean to dismiss them by not spending time on them. They are fundamentals of the faith, right up there with the virgin birth and the deity of Christ and the blood atonement and the bodily resurrection. You have the inspiration of the Scriptures, and what ought to be up there with those is the preservation of the Scriptures. Because once you understand that God has promised not only to inspire His Word, but He has also promised to preserve it, then that makes a difference in what you understand to be the Word of God. Okay, now there's a, there's a commonality here. You know, I mentioned some other um, uh, fundamentals of the faith, the virgin birth and all that. I'm going to tell you now that you're going to believe inspiration and preservation by faith. Those things are matters of faith. You're going to believe it because the Bible presents them to you that way. And if you believe what the Bible says about itself, then you'll understand that God has inspired a book that makes it different from every other book on the planet. You'll also understand that God has preserved that word infallibly and without error. Now, we'll talk a little bit about what that means, but I want you to know that these doctrines are no different from every other doctrine. The virgin birth. You believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. Why? Because words in a book told you that. You believe it by faith. Now, that faith is not just in any book. It is in what we consider to be the Word of God. Now, as a preacher, I believe in the virgin birth. I, I believe Jesus was born of a virgin. I believe that actually happened just that way. But I believe it by faith. Medically, that's an impossibility. Scientifically, people would say that just cannot happen. But it happened, and we believe it happened, because God not only supernaturally intervened to cause a virgin to conceive and bear a son, but also because He gave us a book that tells us about that. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Why? By faith. I wasn't there when Jesus was put on the cross. I wasn't there when He came out of the tomb. I wasn't an eyewitness of that. I believe it because there are words in a book that tell me He rose from the dead the third day. And I believe that book. That's why we call that book the Word of God. There's a lot of... Every, everything else runs just that way. I just want to use one more. The forgiveness of sins. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says that all of your sins are forgiven. There is no outside evidence for that. There's no tangible anything for that. Now, someone may, some people cry and some people laugh when they get saved. Some people do neither. And none of those are proof positive signs that anything has happened. That's how they feel emotionally uh, at that moment. But let me tell you, the only way you know that your sins are forgiven is for someone to have told you that. And because you were told that, that's really what causes the emotion to come about. That's the reason people are all happy or thrilled or whatever when that time comes, because they realize the spiritual transaction has taken place. But if God didn't tell you that in words in a book, you wouldn't know anything about it. 
because there's no tangible evidence for that. Every doctrine that we believe, like these I'm talking about now, and these two that are on the board, we believe them by faith. I believe the Bible was inspired of God because the same book that tells me Jesus was born of a virgin, the same book that tells me He rose from the dead bodily, and the same book that tells me my sins are forgiven is the same book that tells me He inspired this Word and He preserved it without error. If you have a problem believing either one of those doctrines, then you really have a problem with this book not with me. So we just need to make those ground rules kind of clear uh, right off the bat. Now, there's some things the Bible claims to be, and you need to know what those things are, because that's important when it comes to understanding what Bible, what Bible version you're going to use to study from. You need to understand some of these things, first of all. And we're not going to spend a lot of time looking at the Scriptures uh, I'll, I'll quote a few of them. We'll turn to a few of them. But you understand we've got one study to get this done. But I'm sure that most of you that are listening to this are familiar with Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 where it describes that the, where the Bible says about itself that it claims to be the Word of God. You're also familiar with that same scripture over there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 where it claims to be the Word of God and that you're to receive it just that way. It doesn't just claim to be the Word of God. It claims to be divinely inspired. That is, God breathed. That God, by the way, the Bible doesn't say that it is God breathed. It says it's inspired. There's a, that's the right choice of word and there's a reason for that. But that inspiration is what the Bible claims for itself. It claims to be preserved, and the last thing is it claims to be absolute truth. Now, here's where I want to take you to the PowerPoint. Look with me at a statement that Jesus makes in John chapter 17 and verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So here's one of the things the Bible claims, and we know this to be so, is that this book that we call the word of God is truth. Now, I've given you just one simple verse. A actually, if we're to study this doctrine out, we're going to find out it's not just truth, it's absolute truth. So much so that we can judge everything about our faith and practice out of this book. Now, let me give you another verse. I'm going to take you to Proverbs chapter 30. And I'm going to show you something. We're going a little further than just this book being true and containing truth. But I want you to notice something else. Here it is, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Now, the part I'm after is the first part of that verse where it says, Every word of God is pure. Now, that means this book, and you know, I, this, I know it's a simplification, but we don't think about it. Every book is made up of words. The Word of God is made up of words. And what's pure about this book is every word, not the general intent, not the, the idea, not the concept, the words. That's what the Scripture says. Every word is pure. It's not just, it kind of contains the general idea or the basic concept or the, or the, or, or the intent. I, I just really want us to understand that because that's important. Every word in the Bible, if it is the Bible, is a pure word, which constitutes a book of truth. Now, God has written a number of books. I don't want to go into that because, again, we'd take a whole study just to go through all the books that God has written. We don't think about that very, very much either. But God's really written quite a few books. There's a number of them written in the Old Testament, the book of Members, and uh, that's really an amazing book. I just can't help but just give you a one line on it, and that is to say that the book of Members is there so that when anything happens to you, it doesn't matter. If you get blown to bits... The book of Members contains everything about you so that God reconstructs you just the way you're supposed to be. You say, well, he doesn't really need to do that, does he? He's omnipotent. But in that matter, God's not really operating out of his omnipotence. There's something else going on there, and that has to do with your sonship. And we really don't have time to talk about that. So let's talk about two books we can spend some time on. They're both contained in a single passage over in the book of Revelation. One of them is the book of works, and the other one is the book of life. Let me just read these for you in this passage. We'll start uh, in Revelation chapter 20, and we'll start reading in verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, 
and the books were opened. Now, I know when you're watching this on the video, you see that highlighted, and we're going to stay on the passage here, but those books were opened, and another book was opened. That's a book separate from the books plural, which is the book of life. So now we have the book of life there. Now let's keep reading. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, plural, according to their works. Now, if you'll notice, that book of life is actually set off by colons. Books, and then there's a colon, and then it says, and another book was opened, which is the book of life another colon, and then it returns back to the books to say, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. And that means everything that has ever been done. Now, this takes place at the great white throne judgment. And just as a, as a real brief thing, as you come across here, and here's the cross, and, and then you have this uh, time of forbearance and mercy that was given to Israel in Acts 1 through 7 here. And then, of course, uh, you have the conversion of the apostle Paul and, and then the coming of of the, the dispensation of Gentile grace, okay? And we'll just outline it right here. And then that ends, of course, with the rapture of the church. And, um, uh, and then you have the, the last seven years of Daniel's 70th, uh, that seven years of the tribulation, Daniel's 70th week, and the Lord returns at the advent. And, and then there's the, the thousand-year millennial reign that's right here. And at the end of that time, there's the last great battle, and, and then after that, right up here, there's a throne set, and that is the great white throne. Now, that's not to be confused with the judgment seat of Christ. That happens over here after the rapture of the church because it pertains to the body of Christ. But the great white throne judgment is the thing out here where God's going to settle all the accounts. Even though during this dispensation of grace, God is not putting... In fact, though, here's what the Scripture says, that He is not imputing sins to men's accounts. That, it, 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 he's not imputing sin to us. But when men reject Jesus Christ and die, when you get back over here to the great white throne, they all get called up to the great white throne, and the books that have recorded all their actions, all of those things they did will be imputed back to them at the great white throne. And then they'll go out into eternity based on that. That's going to be an awesome display. But, but the thing to understand here is that's where we're at over here, and these two books get opened up. I say two books. The two, there is a book of life, but then there's a set of books that contains works. Now, let me ask you a question. How important is it for those books to be accurate? What if someone else's works got put on a different account? What if there was something that got done, some heinous thing, that actually got transcribed over and put on the wrong person? Would that be important? Would that have any meaning? Do you trust that God's book of works is accurate? Now, I know from one standpoint, you may be looking at your life and saying, <laughs> you know, I'm not really sure I want all those things on my account, but you sure don't want someone else's on there. And if, and if there were something good that was done, you don't want that going somewhere else, right? You want that put on your account. Well, here's what I'm going to tell you. God has a book of works, and it's important that that book be infallible and without error. And because I understand the nature and the character of God, I have every confidence that that book will be 100% accurate, and no one will be able to contest one single thing when those books are opened up. Every entry will be 100% accurate. Here's the other book. Let's take a look back at the, at the book of Revelation, and let's look at this now, and we're going to begin reading in verse 12, Revelation 20, 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of things written in the books, according to their works. And I want to skip down to verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Well, here's my question for you. How important is it that that book be accurate? Do you believe the book of life will be infallible and without error? I do. I believe that every name that's supposed to be in the book of life is going to be in there. It's God's book. And I believe because of His character and nature that that book is going to be 100% accurate. Here's what I also believe. That book has been around for a while. It's going to be around for a while yet. Even if you think the rapture happens today, you still have a thousand-year millennium. 
Names are going to get entered into that book, which means it not only has to be started out accurate, but at the end, when it's all finished, it has to still be accurate. I believe it will be without error. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. These things that I'm talking to you about now apply to every book God has ever written, including this book. I believe that God not only gave us this book perfectly, but He will preserve this book perfectly because it is that important that it continue to be infallible and without error. I believe that it is what it claims to be. I believe that it is the inerrant Word of God. I also believe that every word is pure. Now, taking that same thing, let's go to Psalm 119 and see another claim that the Bible makes for itself. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And that means that this book was settled ever before Adam came on the scene. God had already settled this word forever. He knew what it would be, and when it was delivered here, it was delivered in that same form. Now, what I would like to do is take you to another verse, Psalm 12 and verse 6, and notice the emphasis. The words of the Lord are pure words. Most emphasis is on the words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them. Them what? The words. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve what? Them. He promised to preserve those words from, from this generation forever. I, I believe that the Word of God is not only given by inspiration, almost everybody that, you know, really, unless they're just so far out in left field, they're just apostate from the beginning, almost everyone believes in the inspiration of the originals, whereby falls apart is the preservation. Now, the Bible doesn't fall apart there. The Bible talks about the words. The words are pure words, and those words are preserved. And that's exactly the terminology that the Bible itself gives those words. So it's important, I think, for us to see that. Now, in view of that, you have to understand that all words are not the same. Words have meanings. And when you pay attention to words, especially when you're God, that becomes a very important issue. I believe by faith that God inspired that book and that He preserved that book, and that's the testimony of this book. And again, we're running through just a few verses very quickly. Believe me, we could spend six hours on this and drive this nail deep into the wood to where the only way you would get out of this is to just absolutely refuse to believe the testimony of the Scripture concerning itself. But now there's some things, with all this information, there's some things that you need to know. And that is that we get our Bible from... Now, I'm going to use the original languages, not from the original manuscripts. We don't have original manuscripts. And when someone says, this is a, a pretty good rendition of the original, no one alive today has ever seen the original or a copy of the original or a copy of a copy of the original. We don't go back that far. Now, we don't have that. But what we do is we have manuscripts that are written in Hebrew and Aramaic, and those are for the Old Testament, and then we have Greek manuscripts that constitute the New Testament. And we actually translate out of these into English. That's what a version is all about. And that's what we do. Now, you need to understand that because of this, there are two lines of Bible history. This is very important now. You have a line this way. Now, just, I'm just going to give it to you because I'm going to give you this one. You have a line that comes through Syria in which certain things are going to be carried out. Um, this line, the Syria part's not important for you to understand. I, I, there's some folks, I'm saying this, you understand what I'm talking about. But, but, but here's the thing. In this line of manuscripts, there are 5,321 pieces of manuscript. 5,321. All of these, now these are all not the same size. Some of these are smaller and some of these contain much larger portions of Scripture. But the thing is where they have duplicates, where you have you know, a, a series of them that all are reading through the same parts of the Scripture, 
they all read the same. Because of that, this is called the majority text, or you'll see this abbreviated MT. Now that's the, and the reason they call it the majority text is because the vast majority of all the manuscripts that we have all read like this. And from this, that would be great when you get a translation of the Bible that comes from the majority text. Now that's exactly what that is. Now there's a second line. Let me scoot this over a little bit here. There's a second line and it comes through Alexandria, Egypt. Now this one came through Syria. This one comes through Alexandria. There was 5,321 pieces of manuscripts in this line. In this line, there are 45. Now, if you're doing a percentage here, what you actually have is you have 99.2 something over here, and you have less than 1% of all the manuscripts that read like this. But the thing you need to know about these 45 is that out of that 45, there's only a handful that are bigger than just a couple of verses. Just a handful. 40 of them are minuscule. They're very small. They contain very, just a single verse or just a fragment of a passage. They're very small. The second thing you need to know about these is that, and, and it, it, no matter if you take the 45 or just the handful, these read differently than these. Now remember over here, you got over 5,000 witnesses that read the same. Over here, you have 45 witnesses and they all disagree with each other. In fact, with the number one and two over here, there, you cannot go more than two verses without them disagreeing. And then you might go another verse and another one, and two more verses and another one, but not more than two. Thousands upon thousands of times, these witnesses all disagree with each other, and they disagree with this. Now, the thing that I'm pointing out to you when I say this is because... From this line right here comes every single translation you have except the King James. I'm speaking to you in August, at the, the last day of August in the year 2010, and as of this date, the King James Version is the only translation that is translated from the majority text. It is the only one. Every other translation you want to name, it doesn't matter what it is, it comes out of the Alexandrian line of 45 witnesses in which they all disagree with each other. There is no common uh, understanding among them. And so everything comes from here. The NIV, the New American Standard Bible, the Old Revised Standard Version, Moffat, Weymouth, Godspeed, it doesn't matter, you name it, they all came from this. So that's actually going to be very important later on in our discussion for this reason, and I'll remind you of it later. These versions are not English updates of the King James. That's not what they are. You have the idea, well, this has a lot of these and thous in it, and that makes it really hard for me, so I like a Bible where they don't have that. Well, first of all, the ye's and the you's and the these and the thous are there to show you the difference between when he's talking to one person or talking to a group of people, more than one, plural. Some of those were ye is a plural, you is a singular. But that's what the King James is doing. It's not just trying to be archaic or Elizabethan. It's actually giving you information that you're not going to get from these because they've destroyed all of that. The next thing is, they're, and they're not updating the language they are translating from an entirely different text. Now, is this, are these texts that much different from here? Oh, my goodness. In thousands upon thousands of places, there are terrific differences. There are massive omissions. There are additions. There is word changes. And some of those word changes cause verses to say the exact opposite. Now, there's too many for me to list all of these, and I don't want to bore you with a bunch of this, but let me give you an example. 
Because out of this line, let me talk about the number one. By the way, when we're talking about translations, the number one translation is the NIV, sold in America today. Seven out of every ten study Bibles are NIV. And the NIV is translated from this. The, which of these 45 does it come from? It comes from a guy called Sinaiticus. Now, they put those... They put those names together as part of a trade language. It makes it pretty difficult. Let me see if I can. Sinai, you understand. You've heard of Mount Sinai. Well, there is a Mount Sinai in Egypt at St. Catherine's Monastery. It sits at the foot of that Mount Sinai. And it is in that monastery that a man named Tischendorf found this manuscript called Sinaiticus. It was in a burn bin. They had it in a pile of other things to be burned to keep the monastery warm. He found it. He went through it. And after looking at it, he decided he would ask if he could have it. They only gave him part of it at that time, about 43 pages of it. He took it back and he poured over it. And, 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 and let me tell you, the liberal scholars of the day were elated because now they had something that read very different from all the other evidence that they had collected. So here's what you really have. Imagine that you're sitting in a, in a stadium and something happens on the field and 5,321 people tell you what they saw happen and all their testimonies agree. But 45 of the crowd, they disagree with the crowd here, but they also disagree with each other about what happened. My question to you is, which testimony will you go with? Will you go with this that has a unified testimony? Or will you go with one guy who happens to see it differently from everyone else? Now, that's a poor illustration, but it kind of gives you the idea that when a guy bases a translation on something that opposes the majority text, he doesn't have much to go on that it's going to get worse. Let me just show it to you. And by the way, I know you figured out by now, what you're looking at now are the reasons why at Millennium Bible Institute we use only the King James Version of the Bible. This is one of the reasons. I'm going to give you more. But it's because this is in the line of the pure text. Everything that comes through Alexandria, Egypt... Look, if you know anything about your Bible, you already understand about things that are going on. So anyway, I, I, I'll just give you some other things here. Sinaiticus is the, they claim this is the oldest and the most reliable of all the manuscripts. And so here's this manuscript over here, and, they, and, 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 and now they've collected that. It actually is in several different, most of it's in the British Museum, but it is scattered in some pages uh, at different museums around the world. Let me give you a verse to show you one of the changes one of the over 18,000 changes that Sinaiticus made from the majority text. Because this is how it shows up. Because how this reads is how these versions write the verses when they translate. So let me just give you one. Here it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity... I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Now, as you're looking at this verse, the part that's yellow bolded in the middle is the part that's missing out of the NIV. And the reason that's missing is because it's missing out of the Sinaitic manuscript. So what they did is they gave you a verse that says, now this is the King James, and this is what all of the testimony behind the King James says. But there's not one in the majority text that has 1 Corinthians 13 in it that doesn't read that way. But when you get to the Sinaitic manuscript, it says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am nothing. That's it. All the rest of that verse is gone. Now that's one of over eight, 18,000 differences between the King James and, and the text behind it and the other translations and the text behind them. This is not a secret. All you have to do is turn to the front of those Bibles and it will tell you 
what the, that has been translated out of. That, it's, not, it's not a mystery, it's just no one ever does that, and so no one really knows about it. Let me give you an idea of what's in the Sinaiticus Old Testament. Now, what's in it? Listen carefully. Here's all that's in it. Genesis, starting with chapter 23 and running. Let me just put it over here. Here's Sinaiticus, okay? Genesis chapter 23. I'm sorry, 23. And running to, uh, yeah, chapter 24 and verse 16. There's your book of Genesis. 50 chapters in the book of Genesis. But, but Sinaiticus has nothing else there. Has about a chapter and a half is what it has. Then you have Numbers. Numbers chapter 5 over to chapter 7 about verse 20. That's the entire book of Numbers. You got about two chapters. Then you jump to 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles runs from chapter 9 to chapter 19. That means everything before these numbers is missing and everything after these numbers is missing. It runs to Ezra to Nehemiah. It does have part of the Psalms. Not important for me to list them all because you're already getting the idea. It does have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, and let's see, something, Joel. It's Joel through Malachi. Joel through Malachi. It does have that. Now, that's what you have in the Old Testament. And when you're talking about 39 Old Testament books, you're missing some books out of the Sinaiticus. So what happens? When these guys translate out of the Sinaiticus in the NIV and the NASB and all those others, you know what you wind up with? You wind up with translating verses for which there is no verse. So when they put it in the NIV, that verse reads... There is no piece of manuscript on the face of the earth that reads the way they translated it. There's no authority for it except the scholar. He decided. Did he have any Hebrew or Aramaic for the Old Testament or Greek for the New Testament when he filled in missing places? He had no authority for that. So he put something in there that isn't found anywhere on the face of the earth. So you need to know that there's a big difference here, especially when you start deciding, wait a minute, the Word of God is truth and every word is pure and God promised to preserve it. So now you need to ask yourself, is that, is that the preserved Word of God where every word is not only preserved but pure? See, I'm just, I, I know this is, for some of you, this is not where you wanted to go, but this is the fact of the matter. So if you're intellectually honest, you'll hear this, you'll make a decision in light of the evidence. Now, if you're not, if you have a greater allegiance to your agenda than you do to the Word of God, you might, I have nothing, I don't know what I can say to you. But if your allegiance is to the Word of God, well, then here you go. Now, here's what, now that's what the Old Testament in Sinaiticus, that's what it includes. Let me just read for you very quickly what the New Testament omits. It omits Matthew 12, 47, chapter 16, verses 2 to 8, chapter 17, verse 21, chapter 18, verse 11, 23, 14, 24, 35, Mark 7, 16, uh, 944, 946, 1126, 1528, 16, 9 through 20. By the way, 16, 9 through 20, if you'll look that up in your Bible, it's when Mary came to the tomb and found the empty tomb and the resurrected Jesus appeared to them. That was one of the proofs of the resurrection. That's missing out of Sinaiticus. So you know what they did? When they first published a translation outside of Sinaiticus, they left those verses out and Mark chapter 16 ended, Mark chapter 16 ended at verse 8. But everybody had a King James had verse 9 through 20 about the resurrection. So you know what? People quit buying that translation because they saw a huge chunk of verses missing. So you know what they did? They put them back in. So they put 9 through 20 back in, but they put a footnote out there at the bottom that says verses 9 through 20 are not in the oldest and most reliable manuscripts. You know what that was about? Making a buck. They couldn't sell their Bible if, if they didn't have all the verses. So what they did is they put them back in so you would have them, but they went ahead and told you they really didn't belong there. 
You need to decide what is the Word of God and what isn't. You need to make, it's an important decision. It's a decision every Christian has to make. By the way, when you get to Mark 9, I mentioned Mark 9, 44. When those verses are coming down, you know how they're numbered in your Bible? They go like this, 41, 42, 43, 45, 47, 48, and that's how they're numbered in an NIV. Verses 44 and 46 are completely missing, and they just jump the numbers. Because if they don't, the numbering is going to be off at the end. It won't match up. And they know that. So what they want you to do is just kind of look at stuff and not notice. So these are missing. They just omit the number. You should look at that. I mean, I'm just giving you examples of this. I know, again, not a popular thing, but that's the thing you need to understand. The other biggie in the let me erase some of this here. The other biggie in the Alexandrian line over here is one called Vaticanus. And as you can see from the name Vatican, it is in the Roman library. No Protestant scholar has ever seen it with his own eyes or handled it. Pictures have been taken of it, and that's the only way you know what's in the Vatican manuscript. Um, it differs, by the way, when you compare that to Sinaiticus, these two disagree in over 3,000 places. Now, they're both in the Alexandrian line. They both differ from the majority text. But the thing you need to understand is there's some things missing in Vaticanus too. Here's what's missing. Genesis chapters 1 to 46. Well, those are minor. You, you just need the last four chapters of Genesis, right? I mean, if I, but you know what? When they print this thing up, though, guess what? They do put something in there. Do you know why? Because no one will buy a Bible missing the first 46 chapters, and they know it. And it's not about producing the Word of God. It's about making a buck. Uh, Psalm 105 to, 10, to 137, completely missing out of this Bible. All, everything after Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14 is missing. The entire book of Revelation is missing. The entire book of 1 Timothy is missing. The entire book of Philemon is missing. Let's see, I have a list here, and I'm just trying to do it here. Oh, it's not just 1 Timothy. It's also 2 Timothy, and also the book of Titus. They're all missing. By the way, a few of those happen to be dispensation of grace epistles. You don't really need those, do you? So the thing I'm saying is, you know, when you get this, but you know what? They won't print that book. They won't print their Bible, they translate out of this, with those things missing. There's going to be something in there because you obviously won't buy a Bible where those things are missing. You say, well, I think it's unfair, Mike, for you to categorize them as just trying to make money. Well, you understand that the King James Version is the only Bible that there is no copyright. Anybody can print a King James Bible, and you don't have to pay anything to do it. You could print a King James Bible. I could print a King James Bible. So everybody prints a King James. That's why every publisher publishes a King James Bible. No one publisher. Nelson does it. Cambridge does it. Oxford does it. Every publisher publishes a King James Bible. There's no copyright. Never has been. But when you get to the NIV, now somebody owns the copyright on that. And you only have so many verses you can actually pull out of the NIV and put on a printed page unless you get written permission from the publisher. Only one publisher makes money off the NIV. Only one publisher makes money off the New American Standard Bible. Only one publisher makes, makes money off of all these other translations. It is about the money. And by the way, if you change the words up... In the, see, if it's King James, it's just King James. But if it's anything else, you change the words up, now you can get a copyright. Now you're the sole person to publish. Now you get all the money. Now, there are some misconceptions, and this is the last thing I need to talk to you about. Uh, the, first trans, the first misconception is that Bible translations, all these other translations, they're just updating the King James English. I've already demonstrated to you that that is not the case. They would love for you to believe that, but that is not it. The new versions, they say, are easier to understand. I'm going to give you some things on the PowerPoint here, and I'm just going to run through them very quickly. You tell me if this looks easier to understand. Here's the first one. I think there's a couple of slides there. John chapter 5, verse 2. It says in the NIV, surrounded by five covered colonnades. In the King James, it says having five porches. 
You tell me which is easier. Here's the next one. Ezekiel 8, 16, between the portico and the altar. But the King James says between the porch and the altar. Here's the next one. Psalm 122, 7. The NIV says citadels. King James says palaces. The next one is in Ezra 8, 36. It says to the royal satraps. The King James says under the king's lieutenants. But you all knew what satraps were, didn't you? Okay. Genesis 6, 4 says the Nephilim were on the earth. The King James says there were giants in the earth. And then uh, 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 th this one says uh, uh, Gallio was proconsul of Achaia. King James says Gallio was deputy of Achaia. I think I have one more in here. Yeah, Proverbs 21, 24. The NIV says overweening pride and the King James says proud wrath. See, you can say, well, I, there's some places where I understand the NIV better than the King James. Okay, I'm just showing you that's not what that was about, was updating the language. If it was about updating the language, those things would have been changed. I'm just trying to show you that's not the intent of the translations. It never was, and it is not now. Now, some people say, well, all translations say the same thing. They just use different words. You know, I was picking and choosing as I was going through here because I actually had some Old Testament references that I wanted to give you to show you how these translations, the NIV, the NASB, the RSV, all those, they say in some places the exact opposite of the King James. Now, you just need to know that those are in there, and, and they are. Um, let me show you some other differences. I opted rather to give you these examples because, listen, folks, devotional reading will never produce knowledge. If you're serious about Bible study, and I think that's why you're probably on our website, then you need to understand some things about the Bible. So here we are in Luke chapter 9 and verse 56. The King James says, For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them, and they went to another village. The NIV says this. Here's the whole verse. And they went to another village. Now, if that's what you prefer, okay. How about 1 Timothy 3.16? The King James says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. But when you come to the NIV, it says, beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body and was vindicated by the Spirit. But it never identifies the he. The problem is the King James tells you that Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. The NIV just says Jesus was manifest in the flesh. It never calls him God here. So there is a problem. Uh, the next one is uh, Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 11. It says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That verse is omitted in the NIV. 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Uh, the King James says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And, uh, and there are th verse 8 says, And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. The NIV has left out the whole highlighted part of that verse. The Trinity is out. There is no Father, Word, and Holy Ghost. It just simply says, for there are three that testify, verse 7, and then it just says, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are in agreement. So there's a huge difference here. So, you know, it just depends on where you are doctrinally. Here's one uh, that I really like, and that is in the King James it says, now, there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines where Elhanan, the son of Jera, uh, Jer that's a, I love that name, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, whose staff, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. So we see Elhanan slew the brother of Goliath. But look what the NIV says. Same verse. In another battle with the Philistines at Gob, Elhanan, the son of Jer Oregon, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath, the Gittite. Well, wait a minute, I thought David killed Goliath. But now the NIV is telling you David didn't kill Goliath. Uh, Elhanan killed Goliath. The King James told you he killed the brother of Goliath so that you understand what, exactly what's going on. Otherwise, you have a conflict there. Here's the next misconception. People will come along. After you point this out, they'll say, well, there's mistakes in every translation. I just want to remind you of what we covered at the very beginning so you wouldn't 
you know, you wouldn't lose track here. Because there was some mistakes in every translation. Here's what God promised. I'll inspire my word. Every word is pure, and I will preserve it forever. If you think there's mistakes in everything, now you have a problem with the testimony of Scripture. What will you do? Doubt the virgin birth next, the deity of Christ, the blood atonement, the bodily resurrection. What's next? All you have to do is make up your mind what you believe, and it really doesn't matter what this book believes then. But for those of you that are serious about the Bible, you understand what the Bible has claimed. And so the idea that we don't have a Bible today without error is to call God a liar. I'll let you defend that one at the judgment seat if and when you get there. There also is another misconception, and that is that lots of translations come from the majority text. But I've already shown you, I kind of jumped ahead, the King James is the only one to come from the majority text. Every, all you have to do is look in the front of those Bibles, they'll spell it out for you. The other misconception is that the only people that are King James people, I've heard of you people before, you're radical, you're out there in left field, you're all by yourself, nobody of any substance has anything to do with that kind of a deal. Well, let me tell you that historically, everyone rejected the manuscripts that these other versions come from. Only in the last 100, 125, 140 years have these things really begun to come to the fore. We got enough liberal scholarship to get behind them. We got publishers that were willing to get behind a corrupted version, and they produced them for money. Now, you don't have to believe that. All you have to do is know church history. The fact that someone even bring that point up indicates to me they either don't know church history or they're being dishonest about it. All you have to do is go look up the record. Now, here's the other thing, and that is that you say, well, no one of any scholarship actually has anything to do with the King James. They all prefer these others. Well, I want to read to close out this thing a quote from the co-editor of the New American Standard Bible. His name is Frank Logsdon, and I'm going to give you several quotes here, and here it is. It says, when questions began to reach me pertaining to the New American Standard Version, at first I was quite offended. However, in attempting to answer, I began to sense that something was not right about the NASV. Now, this is the co-author of the NASV. Upon investigation, I wrote my very dear friend, Mr. Lockman, explaining that I was forced to renounce all attachment to the New American Standard Version. Frank Logsdon came to understand exactly what was going on. Now, I want to continue to give you his quote. I must, under God, renounce every attachment to the new American standard. I'm afraid I'm in trouble with the Lord. We laid the groundwork. I wrote the format. I helped interview some of the translators. I sat with the translator. I wrote the preface. I'm in trouble. I can't refute these arguments. It's wrong. It's terribly wrong. It's frighteningly wrong. And what am I going to do about it? I can no longer ignore these criticisms I'm hearing, and I can't refute them. The product is grievous to my heart and helps to complicate matters in these already troublous times. The deletions are absolutely frightening. There are so many. Are we so naive that we do not suspect satanic deception in all of this? I don't want anything to do with it. The finest leaders that we have today haven't gone into it, the new version's use of a corrupted Greek text, just as I hadn't gone into it. That's how easily one can be deceived. I'm going to talk to him. He's talking about Dr. George Sweeting, who was then president of Moody Bible Institute, about these things. You can say the authorized version, the King James Version, is absolutely correct. How correct? 100% correct. If you must stand against everyone else, stand. And that was the testimony of Frank Logsdon until the day he died, and that was written in 1977. Now, Frank Logsdon understood the issue that was at stake here. He just hadn't ever gone into it. But once he saw it, a man who is intellectually uh, uh, honest, no matter how his involvement, he will understand that he has to make a decision about if he is going to claim to preach the Word of God, where in the world are you going to find it? I am holding in my hands, not the original autographs. The originals are inspired, fine. If you don't have originals anymore, inspiration does you no good. But there is a promise to preserve the words, not just the intent, not just the concept, not just the thoughts. Those are pure words, and they are preserved, and God promises to do that, and they are preserved in the authorized version of the Bible for English-speaking people.
Now, for the Spanish Bible, there is one that is translated out of the Textus Receptus. All I'm saying to you is, now you know just a few reasons why Millennium Bible Institute always and only will be using the King James Version of the Bible in all of its classes. We will never sit in judgment of it. We will never correct it. You will never hear us say, well, a better translation would be because there is no better translation. This is exactly what we are supposed to have. So there's lots of other reasons too. Boy, we could spend a long time on this. But for those of you that are watching on the video, I hope that you'll see this with the intent in which we give it to you, not to be malicious, not to make you feel bad. How would you know unless someone told you? So I hope that you'll join us as we study through what we cons consider to be the infallible, eternal, inerrant word of the living God without mixture of error that is the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. And God bless you as you do it.